Hi, I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf and welcome to my podcast, Cleaning Up the Mental Mess, a podcast dedicated to helping you take back control of your mental and physical health. I am very excited about today's guest because not only do I love his books, but he's just so full of excitement about life that it's hard not to be happy after speaking with him and listening to him. Joining me today is Neil Pasricha. Neil is the author of six best-selling books, including the Book of Awesome, an in-demand speaker and a top podcaster. His work focuses on themes of gratitude, happiness, failure, resilience, and trust. His first TED Talk, The Three A's of Awesome, is ranked one of the 10 most inspiring of all time and one of my favorite TED Talks. In this episode, Neil and I discuss how to help our children become stress resilient and how to become more stress resilient ourselves. Neil also shares some great tips on how to bounce back after failure, how to find direction in your life, how you can want nothing, do nothing and have everything and so much more. If you like my podcast and enjoy today's episode, please consider leaving a five-star review wherever you listen. And don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Neil, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm a great fan of yours. I love what you do. In fact, this morning I was actually just listening to you, your latest interview with Jordan. I've actually interviewed Jordan and I loved your interview with him. I actually wrote down a couple of things you said that I'm going to ask you to talk about. So you, you're great. Thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Leaf. It's going to be fun. Okay, so before we start, can, can you just share a little bit more about yourself that's not in your bio? You know, what got you where you are today, why you do what you do, what keeps you motivated, all that good stuff. <laughs> sure. My name is Neil Pasricha. I'm 40 years old. I live in Toronto, Canada. About 10 years ago, my wife left me and my best friend took his own life. And so I started a blog to try to cheer myself up. It was called 1000awesomethings.com. And every single day I came home from work for a thousand straight weekdays and I wrote down a simple pleasure like wearing warm underwear from out of the dryer, getting called up to the dinner buffet first at a wedding or flipping to the coals out of the pillow in the middle of the night. Over the four years or a thousand days that I wrote that blog, it blew up. It became totally viral. It ended up hitting 100 million people, and it won the award for best blog in the world from the International Academy of Digital Arts and Sciences two years in a row. Amazing. I remember hearing you on one of your interviews telling about that. It's a fantastic story. Thank you. Yeah. Well, just I'll just close it up real quick is that then that turned into a book called The Book of Awesome and a bunch of sequels and calendars and journals. And flash forward to me in my life, five years later, I met somebody new. We fell in love. We got married. And when her name is Leslie, when she, she's my wife today, when she told me that she was pregnant on the flight home from our honeymoon, I then spent nine months writing a love letter to my unborn child. That turned into a book called The Happiness Equation. And now here we are sitting in 2020. I now have three children. They're all boys. They're five, three, and one. And I'm now thinking a lot about anxiety and stress and mental toughness. And that prompted me to write my new book, which is called You Are Awesome, How to Navigate Change, Wrestle with Failure, and Live an Intentional Life. So that's the story of my seven books, all under the umbrella of how to live an intentional life. Oh, I love that. So it's really come out of your experience, which is fantastic, which you know, it makes it authentic and meaningful. That's such a great motivation. Well, the, your most recent book is You Are Awesome, How to Navigate Change, Wrestle with Failure, and Live an Intentional Life. So you just indicated that having three kids is what inspired you. Can you talk a little bit more about that inspiration and what, why, why were you inspired to write this for your, for literally for your kids? Yeah, for my kids and for myself, as I think all my books are, you know, the, the a thousand awesome things.com blog originally was for me to cheer myself up. Yeah. The happiness equation was originally a letter to my unborn child. And now it's like, I'm 40 years old. I'm quote unquote successful, meaning that my books have done well. I should sort of be confident now. Like for the first time in my life, I should be confident. I'm not like, why is it that when somebody sends me an email, that I perceive to be rude, it like devastates me for days. Like, why am I upset by that? Why, when I get two likes on a photo, do I think I've got no friends, mm. you know? And so I'm like, this is so weird. I, I'm sort of feeling anxious about life and I don't know why. And I'm starting to see a little sort of bits of it in my kids. I look at the research, it turns out that all of us are feeling this way. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jean Twenge at San Diego University mm -hmm. says that anxiety rates have spiked 30% in the past five years. So I think now that it's two things. Number one, 
we grew up relatively easy relative to previous generations. We have no major wars, no major famines. No one's going through the a big depression. And no, you know, mm-hmm. so as a result, we get gold scars and ribbons. We feel pretty good. We got running water. We got we feel safe. We can marry who we want. We have not had to deal with as much failure, so we no longer have the skills to handle it. In addition, our cell phones feed us everybody else's greatest hit. So we've got the compounding effect of cell phones making us feel inferior together with the fact that we haven't developed the internal musculature to navigate failures. And that's why I think anxiety is spiking, and that's why I wrote this book. It's to increase mental resilience, really. It's really a book about resilience Mm. for me and for my kids and anyone that wants to read it. This episode is brought to you by Ned. Ned's collection of full-spectrum hemp oil products contains CBD extracted from the finest organic hemp plants and is one of my favorite go-to products to improve my sleep, reduce pain, and boost my mood. I love Ned's commitment to sustainability and purity. And ladies, they have some great products to help ease period pains and help balance hormones. My daughters love their Natural Cycles collection. Ned products are also non-GMO, a great source of antioxidants, and can help reduce inflammation and will not get you high. You can get 15% off today with free shipping by going to www.helloned.com forward slash Dr. Leaf. That's www.helloned.com forward slash Dr. Leaf and use the code Dr. Leaf. The link and offer details will be in the show notes. Oh, I love that. You know, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist and I've been doing mind-brain research for the last 30 years and I do clinical trials. And the one I've just finished is on a non-pharmacological. So not I don't believe in drugs. I believe in trying to help people understand their, their mind and so on. And to, when I talk about drugs, I'm talking about psychotropics and so on. And it was for anxiety and depression, helping people, you know, to understand resilience and, and so on. And it's just so this is such a good topic and so relevant. That's why I'm so excited about your book. So, you know, good job that you're doing that because it's it's something that needs attention desperately in this day and age because it's been so han- handled so incorrectly. So this is amazing. So basically, this book is about building stress resilience. Can you talk more about some of the strategies and tools and lessons in the book that can help someone become more thick skinned and failure proof, as you'd say? I love I love your little anecdotes. Yeah, sure. Well, the first thing is right now, if I stand up in front of an audience and I ask a room full of people, how many of you sleep within 10 feet of your cell phone? Almost every hand goes up. Mm. And then when I ask that same group of people, hey, what do you do right before bed? Is it checking your cell phone? People, you know, keep their hands up. What do you do first thing in the morning? Check your cell phone. You know, in that report I quoted from Dr. Jean Twenge, she says that the rise of anxiety is due to the ascendance of the cell phone. So the number one thing I recommend to build mental toughness is get your cell phone out of your bedroom. You got to plug it into your basement or somewhere far away. Buy an alarm clock if you must. Okay. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, begin your day with a two minute mental strengthening practice that I call two minute mornings. I do this every morning or I try to. I get a pen and a cue card. You could do it in a journal. And you simply write down three prompts. They are, I will let go of, I am grateful for, and I will focus on. Mm. So the principles underpinning each of those are, I will let go of helps you crystallize and eject a tiny anxiety. Most of us are missing the quote-unquote Catholic confession chamber these days. Uh, A lot of religious practices have a form of confession, but Mm -hmm. the number one growing religion is no religion. So we just don't have a place to put the things that are worrying us anymore. Mm, Very good. Right? Then I I will feel grateful for – or I am grateful for, write down a few meaningful, small, specific things that you're thankful for. When my husband, Antonio, put the toilet seat down, when my three-year-old gave me a painting from school, when my dog learned how to shake a paw, they got to be specific. This is based on research from Emmons and McCullough that shows if you can write down 10 of these a week, you're not just happier, but physically healthier after Mm -hmm. a 10-week period. And then the last one, I will focus on, it turns out, based on my research and the research of others, a lot of what's dragging us down these days is something called decision fatigue, Mm -hmm. which means that we're just overwhelmed by choice. And social media, of course, helps propagate this. And Mm -hmm. just we all have too much to do. It's too much choice. You go on Netflix, you're overwhelmed. You go Mm -hmm. on YouTube, you're overwhelmed. You know, you go to anywhere, you go online, you go, you're overwhelmed. And so I will focus on helps carve a will do from your endless could do and should do. 
And even just taking 30 seconds to a minute to think, what is the one thing I'm going to do today that is that helps you for the rest of the day? Be like, mm. oh, that's my one big focus. I, I just have to, if I get that one thing done, you know, today was a success. Mm. So just to summarize for your listeners, it is a simple two minute morning practice mm-hmm. that says, I will let go of, I am grateful for, and I will focus on as a way to build mental strength for the day. Oh, I love it. So that's really a big part of the book is, is focusing around those techniques. Yeah, the book mm-hmm. is comprised of nine, I call them secrets, but they're really just chapters. Mm-hmm. And what I just gave you is secret number six, which is called Reveal the Heal, but starting your day in the right foot. I and then there's, there's many little ones in the book. We could spend a whole hour talking about them if you'd like, or we could jump around however you want to. Well, t- tell us one more, because I think that's lovely. People love practical stuff. I know my audience loves practical stuff. So tell us one more if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. I have this chapter in the book that's called Telling Yourself a Different Story. It turns out that most of us, when something bad happens to us, we have a natural human tendency to think it's going to be this way forever. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's research done by Daniel Gilbert. He's a famous Harvard psychologist. He wrote the book Stumbling on Happiness. The research is amazing. It's called The End of History Illusion. Mm -hmm. They asked 19,000 people, hey, how's the last 10 years of your life? And everyone paints a tempestuous portrait of ups and downs, left turns and right turns. I was with Jerry and now I'm with Tom and I quit this job and I got fired from here, blah, blah, blah. (laughs) But then when when the same 19,000 people were asked, what is the next 10 years of your life going to look like? They all said, oh, well, I'll still be married to Tom and I'll still be at the vice president of this company. I'll still be living in San Diego. We presume the future will be exactly as it is. The problem is if you just got a divorce, if you just got fired, if you just went through a breakup, if you then you mm. still think I will never meet anyone. I'll be living in the basement forever. I'll never find another job. We are so good at thinking things won't change, but as a result, we don't longer have we don't have the tools to picture the future. We confuse the possibility with the probability. Okay? Mm. We think that just because I can't picture it it won't happen. So what are three questions I use in my book? to help jostle your mind after a bad day or a bad experience, they are, number one, will this matter on my deathbed? Mm -hmm. Okay. Number two is, can I do something about this? And number three is, is this a story I am telling myself? Ask yourself those three questions. Mm -hmm. You got C minus on your science test. Well, will it matter on your deathbed? No. You probably won't even remember you took science. (laughs) Great. Okay. (laughs) You got fired. Can I do something about this? If you can, Go ahead and do it. If you can't, that relieves you of the obligation of trying. Okay? So it's just, mm-hmm. just kind of like the serenity prayer put into mm-hmm. a question. Mm-hmm. And then the third one is, uh, is this a story I'm telling myself? Look, I give a lot of speeches at colleges and universities. You know what people tell me? I failed my parents. I say, why? They say, I, I can't get into med school. I say, why? They say, oh, because I failed biology. I was like, you failed biology. <laughs> I feel my parents is the story you're telling yourself. Mm. Or people say, oh, uh, nobody trusts me. I say, why? They say, because I drink too much. I'm an alcoholic. I say, Okay, I drink too much is a fact. Nobody trusts me is a story. That's a good point. Too often what we are all doing is we are lacquering onto our minds all these invisible stories that we are telling other people. You don't like the gap between your teeth? You think I'll never get married. There's two separate things there. One is a fact. The other is a story. Okay. Mm, I love that. I love that. The fact and the story. To, and to exactly. make that dis- and just distinguish between the fact and the story. Exactly. Exactly. That's so good. So carrying with a gap in the tooth and the marriage, that's great. <laughs> good example. Yeah, exactly. Oh, well, I, you know, and I use, in the book, I use a personal example. I discovered in ninth grade gym class that I had one testicle and everybody else had two. Mm-hmm. I was like that since birth. You know, I had a, a small operation. When I was six weeks old that I was never aware of. Mm-hmm. And then my ninth grade phys ed teacher, my gym teacher said, I crushed a guy's testicle in a wrestling tournament. You know, after that, we all referred to him as half a man. Mm. And everyone burst out laughing and it hit me. I was like, oh my God, like uh, everyone else is too. Guess what, Dr. Lee? For the next like 10 years of my life, I carried around a huge sense of shame. I looked up getting like surgical implants, which is a whole sub industry that actually exists. Yeah, it's a big industry. People get, you know, Mm. silicone implants and stuff. I switched to wearing boxer briefs because I was too embarrassed to get changed in the in the Mm. in the the change room. I like didn't I didn't I wasn't comfortable to date people because I was like they they might see me naked and then you know it would Mm. all be called off because I'm horribly disfigured. That's so sad. Mm. Exactly, and this is but my situation is not unusual. Mm. Everyone's carrying around stuff like that, whether it's about a gap tooth or a bald spot or their height or their weight or their you know what I mean. It's it's we all have so much baggage and part of my book is trying to shed help people shed that and 
by the way, the, the way I do this, of course, is sharing my own stuff. So no. <laughs> helped, writing the book I made me confront a lot of these demons. Head I, on. I, I love it. I love what you're saying. I love the fact that you're authentic with your story because it makes you relatable. I was a practicing clinician for 25 years. And even now, the work that I do teaching people about mind management, it's all about, you know, find your story, find the reason why. And you're so right. Everyone's carrying around something that has influenced the rest of their life. I mean, I've had drug addicts that were like literally like at the end of their tether and it was from literally if you track back it was from a comment that was made like in your situation like you didn't become a drug addict but this is another situation of another person who ended up she was just very boyish looking and and she wanted to be like her brothers and her uh, someone once said to her oh you look like what a cute little boy you've got and that just threw her for the rest she just spiraled downhill lost her whole value in herself and went from pornography to drugs to you name it her life was a wreck and it took honestly almost 35 years before she sort of pulled herself you know pulled herself through it and it was from that one statement so you know I'm so glad you brought that up because it is so true how we've got to separate the story from the fact I love how you put that it's really good thank you and thank you for sharing that story because I think that's it shows the problems <laughs> yeah. that could happen without us even realizing, you know, what's going on in someone's mind, exactly. right? Exactly. And you highlight, yeah. you highlight those sort of things in such a, a great, comfortable way that helps people to feel safe. Because in this day and age, not everyone feels safe because of the whole mental health movement, which is something that I fight against the traditional disease kind of focus. You are helping people to say, hey, you know, you've got a story. It's okay. And there's, let's separate the facts from the story. I love it. I think you're doing a really good service to society with your book. Thank you. Good job. Okay. So I want to just jump on a comment you made in Georgia. Jordan's comment is because it kind of like relates to what we're doing because getting through what you got through was difficult. It wasn't something that was easy and overnight. You make a comment in Jordan's interview this morning that I listened to that the only way to look better is to get bad. I love that. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. As long as I remember what I said. So I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said the only way to, to get better is to get bad. Yes. The only way to look better is to get bad. And you linked it into not testing our losses and failure enough. And, oh, right. You know, having to lose more to win more. You're kind yes. of you're on that yeah. theme. You were, you were on a roll. I have to tell you, you were on a roll and it was very okay. good. Okay, good. Well, this is the way I operate. I'm sure you're the same way yeah. and other people are. I get the engine going and then I just get excited. And with that interview, that you just, you're talking about the Jordan Harbinger podcast. Yes, yes. Yeah, I was in San Francisco. So I was in his house and we were just hanging out there. And so that's partly why you probably sense that. But here's the thing. Mm -hmm. I was maybe 10 years old when my dad bought me a book. And the book was called The Complete Book of Major League Baseball Statistics. Mm. And this was before the internet, so you couldn't just like Google it. Mm -hmm. And I remember like pouring over that book, you know, when I mm -hmm. uh, when I go to bed every night because I loved baseball. So I was always like, who's got, the, you know, Hank Aaron's got the most home runs and Babe Ruth is second. I just loved that mm -hmm. idea of stats. But then I noticed something one day, which is the guy that had the most wins in baseball who's a pitcher named Cy Young. For those that are baseball fans listening, they'll know because they have the Cy Young Award at, at, every year for the best pitcher. He was also the guy with the most losses. I was like, that's puzzling. Like, he's got the most wins and the most losses. Interesting. But then I looked at strikeouts. Strikeouts are the best thing you can do when you're a pitcher. You strike the guy out. Well, the guy who was number one was a guy named Nolan Ryan. And guess who had the most walks? Nolan Ryan. And I was like, that's interesting. The person who had the most wins, also had the most losses. The person with the most strikeouts also had the most walks. Mm. I, I looked around and I noticed this trend continued everywhere I looked. If you ever see someone's fancy wedding photos, have you ever asked a mm. wedding photographer, how do, you, how do you take so many good pictures? They always say the same thing. The reason I have 50 good photos of this wedding and everybody else has 50 kind of crappy ones mm -hmm. is because I took 2,000 pictures. Like exactly. I took 2,000 mm -hmm. photos over two hours. So of course I've got, you know, 0.5% of them are good or whatever that is, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought about myself. It appears, and, and the, even the story I said at the beginning of this interview, I started a blog on a whim called 1000awesomethings.com. It turned into a big viral hit called The, the Book of Awesome. Mm -hmm. But what I haven't told you, and I didn't use to tell people, and I always hid, was the fact that I started that blog when I was 28. 
I had been starting blogs since with my friends since I was 15. And in the book, You Were Awesome, I catalog all the other ones I started, which, by the way, had a grand total of like 10 hits total <laughs> on, on like on like 10 hit on 10 websites. Like I love I, that. From it, 10 to 100 million. <laughs> exactly. And the point is, it's lose more to win more. I had just – I'd figured out some stuff that I didn't even know what I'd figured out. And I look at – there's research on on relationships that I also uncover in the book. It's a, it, under this idea of losing more to win more. And there's this research that came out of the London newspaper, The Telegraph, over in the UK. And they interviewed people who were in stable and secure, loving, long-term relationships. Okay, And they mm-hmm. said, can you sit down on a piece of paper and recount for us every other relationship you've ever been in that led you to this one? Every other one-night stand, every disaster date, every person you dated more than a year, every person you dated less than a year, every bat- blind date. And they had people do this exercise. And they come up, and I put in the book, the average composite index of what the Rocky Royal Road to Romance really is. So mm. for the average woman and man, in a stable long-term relationship, like, I mean, potentially married, potentially having kids, et cetera. It was like something like, you know, 16 relationships, you know, 50, mm. you know, 12 one night stands, like 10 disaster dates, like seven long-term relationships, you know, four relationships of those over a year, three of them less than a year, like this crazy portrait. And that was the average. And that's kind of an average composite of what led them to their stable, long-term loving relationship. And had I known that after every girlfriend that dumped me (laughs) or every, you know, Mm -hmm. person I dated twice and I thought they were the one, Mm -hmm. you know, then it would have given me some tiny sense of comfort. The idea that every quote unquote loss, and you can't chalk up an old relationship as a loss, but every sort of like one that didn't work is in service of a future that will eventually. If you love listening to my podcasts and want to take your mental health healing journey to the next level, then I want to invite you to my 2020 Mental Health Solutions Summit, December 3rd through 5th in Dallas, Texas. The core focus of this conference is to give you simple, practical, applicable, scalable and scientific solutions to help you take back control of your mental health and to help others and to make impactful changes in your community. You will learn how to manage the day-to-day stressors of life, as well as those acute stressors that blindside us. Our goal is to address your most pressing mental health concerns, help you find answers, and equip you with the knowledge and the resources that you need to make the change from living a life of barely surviving to one where you are thriving. There will be sessions on addiction recovery, sex and mental health, how to help your child become stress resilient and manage anxiety, how to detox your brain, nutrition tips to boost mental and physical health, and so much more. Early bird tickets are on sale now, so hurry and get yours today before prices increase on March 31st. We also have limited VIP tickets that include special private Q&A sessions with me and meet and greets with myself, and there are discounts available for groups. For more information and to register today, visit drleithconference.com. The link will also be in the show notes. That's so good. That's so encouraging and so helpful and so realistic. I mean, as you're saying it, I know I'm nodding my head. I know that the listeners are. It's it's just realistic because we know that it, you've got to fight to get through. But in this, I think it's changed so much. You know, you talk about how this day and age has changed and how people are grabbing their cell phones and, you know, everyone's talking about this and it's a quick fix mentality. So we've kind of forgotten the good old hard work, the good old age, that hard work and keep going and keep picking yourself up is 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 important to remember. You know, it reminds me of you know, Thomas Edison. A thousand times he tried before he got the light bulb right. And I remember when they're reading when he was interviewed, someone said, how do you feel about your thousand failures? And he said, they're not failures. It's a thousand things that I know don't work. You know, and it mm-hmm. kind of reminds you what, you know, what you're saying, that you have to turn those into something that's building it's like steps building towards the the the, the goal that, that whatever the the the, the next stage or, or the, so on so that's really great i love that one of my little cousins emailed me like the other day and he mm-hmm. was like neil i want to be a youtuber how do i come up with a big youtube channel and i wrote back to him i said ben you aren't going to like this but the answer is to make a thousand videos <laughs> if you make a thousand videos i guarantee you by that time, your thousandth, you will have a big, popular, successful YouTube channel. So now everyone's breathing this huge sigh of relief that, okay, I can just keep going. 
Well, exactly. And he might not do it and he might not want to do it and he might not be willing to. And that's fine. But if he does do it, if he keeps trying, if he makes a thousand videos, it might take him five years. Then I guarantee by the time he's a thousand, you know, he will have figured it out because he will have figured out on the on video number 50. He'll have figured out lighting by video number 100. He'll figure out the right length by video number 150. He'll figure out his style by video number 200. He'll have had a few things that worked. You know, everything got one hit. Then he'll have had a few that had 500 or a thousand. Be hmm, interesting. Then by you know video 250, he'll have developed some friends in the YouTube community to share ideas with. By video 300, those community members will have given him ideas and vice versa, and they'll have understood the YouTube algorithm a little bit more. And now he'll have good quality videos with his style and tone and the right lighting. So of course, by 400, 500, he's now got getting like 500 to a thousand hits per channel, and he mm. starts to see that his subscriber counts up. Then to the thousand mark, it's all now he's running. And anyone who's we have this myth in our society of the overnight success. Mm. Not, it's not no true. Such thing. There's no such thing. Anyone who's got a popular channel on YouTube, if you were to actually click into their all their uploads and scroll all the way to the back, I guarantee you those first ones are crap. They're garbage and no one watched them. But they serve to the, create the good one today. Exactly, you're totally right. I mean, I, I've got I've spent years in my field. I've been thirty years in my field, and I talk all over the place. And people will come up to me and say, "Oh, I want to do what you're doing. What did you study, or what did you do, or what coaching course? Uh, uh, you know, f- sort of how many degrees later, and how many years of clinical research, at, and and whatever. It, it, it's not an overnight thing, but people will see." like yourself or myself or someone who's doing something and think, you know, how do I get that instantly? What's the instant trick? And that's really, that's a big mistake. And that just, that then people don't keep trying because it's not so easy. And like you say something in related to this, that you, you ask a question, do you love it so much that you are prepared to go through the pain to get it? Yeah, exactly. Because I, one thing I don't like about society today is this, <laughs> we've got this like, commencement speech culture where we mm. want to hear these inspirational speeches. Somebody's on stage and they got a nice mm-hmm. hat on and they say, do what you love and follow your passion and chase your dreams. Well, I hate that. Because Me too. I'll join the club. Thank you for saying it. I hate it so much too. I, I hate that because, I mean, it sounds good and I would definitely cheer for it if I was in the audience. <laughs> but if I really look step back, I'm like, no, the question isn't to do what you love. It's to do, do you love it so much you can take the pain and the mm. punishment too? And that's related to this idea of lose more to win more. For example, the number one self-help author in the past two or three years is a guy named Mark Manson. Mm -hmm. He sold over 9 million copies of this book called The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F, if you know that Mm -hmm, book. mm -hmm. Right, because who doesn't? Because it sold more copies than anyone. Truth of the matter is Mark Manson grew up in Austin, Texas, wanting to be a rock star. He actually grew up literally wanting to be a rock star, like he wanted to be in a band. That was his goal. But then he's starting to lug amps around to clubs at Tuesday night at two in the morning, and he's like, I hate this. And then it's like, you got to master this chord progression so that you can play it, memorize, and sing. And he's like, well, I hate this practice. So he like hated the pain and the punishment that went towards becoming a musician. But when it came to becoming a, a popular self-help author – Guess what he loved doing? He loved going into Facebook and getting into comment wars with people and like coming up with arguments and starting a blog. And that was pain and punishment too. Nobody read his stuff, but he loved the quote unquote pain of it. So, I, and by the way, I worked for 10 years at Walmart and people always said to me in the hallway, people loved it and I did, but some people said, oh, I, I hate this job and I want to quit. And I'd say, oh, so why don't you? Mm. And they wouldn't say it, but the point is, they didn't. They could not take the pain and the punishment that goes along with looking for a new job. Mm, so Handing good. Got a hundred resumes. Getting fifty. No, don't hear back from fifty of them. From the fifty you do hear back, forty say no. From the ten that say we'll talk to you, nine of those say no. From the one, you know what I mean? Like that would take mm, six months of pain and punishment. Exactly. But if you're willing to do that, you'll find a new job. But if you aren't willing to do that, you're here. So then shut up. Exactly. Exactly. Anyone who's run their own business and or done something, I understand that too. I mean, how many failures before you actually get to where you're trying to get to? And then also the measures of success, how people measure success in such an extrinsic kind of reductionistic way instead of looking at at the broader picture. You know, it's a, oh, I love it. You've highlighted something that is an absolute key to like a sense of peace, I think, in people. You know, it, it brings it's hard work, but it's a peace in the midst of that. You know, I, I don't know if that if that explains what you're trying to achieve, but that's how I would see it too. Yeah, you're a lot smarter than me, so if you say so, I believe you. I don't think about that. I don't <laughs> think that's the case. But you know, I just think if I look at what the people that that 
that I work with in my world, which is pretty much everyone, people got on minds and anxiety and depression. A lot of that anxiety is coming from people not wanting to get into those painful places and not wanting to go through it. That's why I really like that phrase of yours, because it's until you dive down into the dirt, you are not going to and recognize the time factor. You're not going to move forward. Okay, so I want to jump into Back to Stress Resilience, your new book. And I want to talk about just in terms of so this book is basically about building stress resilience that you've said, and I love that. Let's talk about parents now. How can we parents teach children? Because you're a dad, you've got three kids, I've got four kids, mine are grown up, yours are little, but how can we teach them to become more mentally tough and resilient? Number one is no kids need cell phones. They just don't. I, I think it's a red herring and we're loading our kids up with technologies and screens way too young. There is a private school in Toronto. And by the way, this screen addiction affects us all. Many parents, including myself, mm-hmm. you know, we suffer from it. Mm-hmm. But first of all, kids don't need to be on them. They just don't. And mm-hmm. so And I've done a lot of work with schools and administrators and parents, and there's a problem. The problem is parents say, oh, I need to know where my kid is at all times. Well, that's that's not true. You don't need to know where your kid is at all times. You think you do because every other parent is tethered to their kid. But Mm -hmm. then as a result, you never let them explore or walk home by themselves from school or like you're you're not letting them. So good. So good. That's Mm -hmm. that's the problem. And then administrators say, well, we'd like to ban cell phones, but parents say that they need them to know where their kid is. So this is a problem. So there's a school in Toronto, it's a private school, so it does cost money, but I've been talking to the administrators there. It's called Branksome Hall, and the the administrators there have have been piloting for the last two years a no cell phones policy, which is Mm. which is pretty brazen these days. Mm, You know, but they don't Yeah, so it's a school and and, and they have like some allowance, you know, I can't remember the details of the system, but like, you know, there's some like maybe some moment at lunch where it's allowed or whatever. But the benefits are Obviously, cyberbullying and all that stuff is shot way down, mm. which is a huge issue. What's gone up is intimacy, togetherness, community. People are talking in the hallways again, like clubs and team signups are, are higher. It. So it's a huge benefit is take away screens. My kids say to me, what am I going to get an iPad? I say, you can buy one for yourself when you're 18. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, that's one. The other thing you can do is like let them fail. Like mm. I just interviewed Dr. Laura Markham for my podcast. Mm-hmm. So I have a podcast. Mm-hmm. It's called Three Books. Mm. I interview people and I ask them which three books most shape their lives. I love it. It's a great podcast. We'll put the link to this and your book in the show notes. Cool. Thank you very much. And so I talked to Laura Markham and I interviewed her about which three books shaped her life. And I don't know if you know Dr. Laura Markham. She's mm-hmm. a parenting expert, right? She mm-hmm. wrote the book Peace of Parent it's Happy Kids. And what she says, or what I'm saying based on my conversation with her, mm-hmm. is aren't letting our kids we're not letting them fail mm. we're we're moving obstacles from you know some people there's this new term snowplow parenting mm-hmm. and and what we should be doing and then the college admission scandal is actually mm. that's, that's exactly the worst part of that and is that it's not that people did it it's that they didn't believe in their kids it's terrible mm-hmm. that's what you think you think my kid's so stupid that, that i have, have to mm. cheat in order to get them in so like bad. it's like the kids left with this feeling like my parents didn't mm. think that i could do it yeah, no, that's they, to me. Not, they undervalued their kids. That's the message they sent to them. Exactly. Or then I must clear the path for you in order for you to be successful. Mm-hmm. It's okay if your kids fail. Let them get nixed from the basketball team. Don't complain to the coach. Like, let let them suffer from some stuff. It, it's okay. If they forget their book at, at home, that's a thing they're going to have to wrestle with. Every skin thickener that they go through in their life helps them become a more resilient adult. And mm-hmm. – it's hard. It's hard when my kid decides to wear no jacket in the winter to mm-hmm. school. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, okay, like then you will have to be the one, <laughs> one exactly. that learns that it'll be like, or whatever. Like, but yeah. I can't. Be, if I just if I provide you with a warm coat every day before you go to school forever for your whole life, and it may, I don't get me wrong, a two year old is an exception, but like depend after a certain age, mm-hmm. then you'll never know how to dress yourself. Exactly. <laughs> like. You know what I mean? Like so, and that's just one weird example. But if there's everything else is like that. You when you what you're doing is removing the per, the chance for your kid to learn in a safe environment. It's okay for them to fail at home. It's okay for them to fail at school. Those are grounds for failure. They're created to encourage failure. If you remove the ability for them to have a crappy science project, then they'll never have a good one on their mm, own. Exactly. It's brilliant. You know, it's some of the things when I was still practicing, I used to tell like literally a prescription for parents besides reading, reading, reading to their kids and letting their kids play, play, play was let them fail, you know, let them fail, let them experience the consequences, stop being a helicopter parent. And it was, I had to like literally teach parents 
to stand back. And, and I used to use the example, and I still do, of, you know, you think of those, the trapeze artists, and there's a safety net underneath. And I'd say to the parents, your kids are on the trapeze of life and your safety net and just keep moving the safety net lower and lower. So it's always there. But you know, as they get older, and so on, you have to have it lower and lower or for whatever different task and that kind of thing. But it's a very it's a such a, I'm so glad you brought that up because it's, it's something that has become I watched over the 30 years that I practice, I watched that I had to teach it more and more in the 2000s, I had to teach that more to my parents than in the 80s when I first started practicing practicing. So it's very interesting. So I'm very glad that you brought, you brought that up. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, and I, and by the way, like I'm, I'm just a dad trying to figure it out. You're doing, you're doing a fantastic <laughs> yeah. job. Yeah. Well, we'll find out, I guess, in 20 years. <laughs> well, your kids can always read your book. <laughs> yeah. That, that's, that's the goal ultimately. You can say, don't <laughs> listen to me, just read my book. <laughs> that's, what yeah. I, that's what I tell my kids. You don't have to listen to me, just read my books. <laughs> Yeah, that's the way to put it. The, the most crystallized version of your thoughts. Hey, another high level thought on parenting is just this idea, this high level principle of under programming. Mm. Right now, kids are so programmed. They're so special. When I say program, that means after school every night they got something. They got mm. swimming, they got violin, mm. they got like soccer, whatever. Blah, blah, blah. Every night they got something. And then. When our kids are rigidly programmed, what you've lost is boredom, mm. which is the meeting ground for creativity because creativity abhors a vacuum. So mm -hmm. creativity fills a vacuum. You lose nature interaction. So that's why we see a spike in quote unquote NDD or nature deficit disorder. Mm -hmm. You lose the idea of like whenever my kids say I'm bored, I say, oh, good. That's mm. great. That means that you'll come up with. And then guess what? Ten minutes later, they've like set up the cushions across the floor and mm. they're playing lava game or whatever but they made it up because i want them to be bored i mm. want our our family vacation not to be and this is just me talking it's not like neil's whatever but i'm like i don't want our family vacation to be like a programmed itinerary mm. of like what challenges through four cities i want it to be all of us sitting in like a place where there's nothing to do mm -hmm. and that's a good breeding ground for daydreaming intellectual expansion we cannot measure the mind like we don't have a good picture of what that looks like but i i just believe that your mind expands it does when it's, it's infinite mm. you know it's, it's, it, and, and by the way and the only thing as you know the only research has ever proven to work in terms of homework is reading exactly you said reading. yeah it's, it's the only homework ever proven to actually work so if by the way the other thing i would say to your kids is don't do any homework yeah <laughs> and, and, reading below age like 12 or 15 or something like that but they should no homework is proven to do anything we, no. we have our kids going to a school where there's no homework no homework policy oh. and we love that my wife's a teacher we love that because we don't we know no no homework actually works and if they have boredom at home that's good and if they don't well there's a pile of books in every room and we don't have tv oh gosh you're so on track honestly i've trained thousands of teachers in in, in the work that i do and thousands of physicians and i can tell you now that one of the things that i try and do in the schools and i don't train in education that much anymore but it would be to stop giving them homework rather give them a book to read you know it's so it's yeah and it, but it's an endless battle especially with the current education system but it's that's good you can find it and you can find a school that works with you like that it's wonderful and the fact that your wife's a teacher and she's got that thank those children that are with her are very 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 lucky so that's really great. I feel that way. And by the way, I may as well just put a plug in for her. She wrote the teaching guide mm. for You Are Awesome. So oh, if, anyone listening, if anyone listening to this happens to want that version, like anyone listening to this as a teacher or a principal or an administrator, and they want to teach the lessons on resilience from You Are Awesome, my book, into the classroom, that's just a free resource she's created for the book for schools. Fantastic. So you, and that's on your website, isn't it? I think so my website, or you could just yeah, my website's just www.neil.com. Yeah. My honestly, I'll just say you could just email my assistant and we'll send it to you. It's just Aaron E R I N at globalhappiness.org. Aaron at Fantastic. globalhappiness.org. Will she will send you? That's she wonderful. She will send you the teaching guide if you oh, want. Oh, that's it. fantastic! Thank you so much. That's really wonderful. We'll make sure we put that in the show notes as well. Yeah, that's I really... can send it to you also. Dr. I'd love that. Have... Yeah, for, that'll be fantastic. Your show notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Okay, so this is really really good. Is there anything else about kids that you? want to say what before we move on to the next question no i'm i like a podcast like a roller coaster right uh, and I, where my eyes are blindfolded i like to not know what's going to happen okay next. well what's going to happen next is the millennials i want to know about millennials so in this book you also share some <laughs> advice because in my clinical trials i've just finished i had found some fascinating research with the millennials and i was interested to hear what you've got to say 
how you know, share some advice for millennials looking for a flashlight to help illuminate the dark path of adulthood. Well, in a way, I think that the book itself does gear itself holistically towards millennials. We talked about you love it so much you could take the pain and the punishment too. We haven't talked about, although I think you want to talk about the three S's of success. Mm, I do. I'd love to. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you can so jump this, into that. There's no, you know, whatever yeah, works. Well, this kind of works for millennials. So basically, most people growing up these days, if they're of the high achieving variety, and I imagine they are, if they're listening to your podcast, they're like, I want it all. You know, I want to be rich. Mm-hmm. I want to have a, I want to have a job that is is so totally soul satisfying and gives me my my purpose, my chi is, you know, my mm-hmm. my ikigai guy is satisfied. And I want to have an incredible lifestyle where I'm home all the time and I don't mm-hmm. work in the evenings and I, you know, I have tons of vacation and I get to travel the world. Okay, that's totally unrealistic. So what I then say to people is, well, what do you really want? And it's this is a and I've draw I draw them a triangle. I call this the success triangle. Mm-hmm. And why did I start doing this? Because people started emailing me and asking me questions, saying, "Oh, Neil, how do I sell a million books?" And I was like, "Was well, that what you want?" They're like, "No, I want to write down my grandmother's memoir." I'm like, well, that's not going to sell a million books. Or I'm like, well, what do you really want? They're like, well, I really, I've always dreamt of having like my book covered in the New York Times book review. I was like, well, that's not going to sell a million books either. And then I realized, oh, there's three kinds of success and it applies to life and it applies to projects. On the triangle, draw three points, like every triangle, and label them sales, social, and self. Mm. Sales is how much money you make. It's like literally commercial success. So Mm -hmm. a book like the book of awesome my first book yeah it sold a million copies and it was great you know like the book i mentioned mark manson's mm-hmm, book right mm-hmm. it sold a lot of copies now my book was it a social success no it actually has received zero positive reviews to this day <laughs> i've not been reviewed by anyone i've not been in the new york times book review it's not been it, nobody would consider my book literature or anything super fancy so it was never covered or treated as a serious book by any sort of you know, it was never mm-hmm. given this sort of like social proof. And self, how did I feel about it? Which is like my internal self. Well, I don't think I, it didn't really solve my problems. Like I was still lonely. I was still coming on my divorce. I was still, mm-hmm. you know, like I still didn't have that many friends. So it wasn't like I thought it was going to solve this problem for me or fix this hole for me. And it really just frankly, to be honest with you, did not. Mm. Now, I think this model is really important because look at the movies. Oscar nominees just came out. Mm-hmm. Well, if you asked me which movie sold the most tickets last year, I could tell you. And if you said which movie's nominated for the Oscars, they're totally different movies. Mm. Even the Oscar nomination is the number one social proof of a movie. You know, like it, Very getting, good winning. example. Mm. Right. And so the example I use in my book, and this is actually from The Happiest Equation, my book before, is Fast and the Furious 7 grossed $700 million, but Moonlight won Best Picture and it grossed $18 million. Mm. Which would you rather have made? Ask yourself that question. Same with music that you make. Same with art that you're making. Same with same with your life. Do you really want to make a lot of money? If so, go be an investment banker. But mm. they work 100 hours a week. Go work for McKinsey. But they work 100 hours a week. Mm-hmm. You know, go do something that for sure makes lots of money. But they work 100 hours a week. If you want to have an incredible lifestyle, great. Choose that. If you ask my wife why she's a teacher, she talks and waxes poetically about how she feels that she can make a difference in children's lives. She also says really openly, I wanted to be a mom who had the summers off. And mm. yes, I could have been the prime minister or the president or you know an emergency room doctor, mm-hmm. but I was really conscious of the fact that I want a lifestyle that allowed me to be present as a mom in the summers. Mm. So she chose that. And by the way, teachers don't make that much money. Mm-hmm. So you see what I'm saying? Like she took mm-hmm. the sacrifice on salary because she's like, I just want that lifestyle. I'm just saying, be conscious of what you want. Hey, millennials, if you're listening to this, pick one. You can't have both. And you certainly can't have both right away. And then mm-hmm. go for that. But be conscious and open and honest with yourself about which one you're chasing. There's three kinds of success, sales, social, and self. And everything can fit into that paradigm. By now, I'm sure you've heard of the dangers of artificial light especially artificial blue light from our devices like phones and TVs. If you aren't familiar with what artificial blue light is and how it can negatively impact your mental and physical health, then I highly recommend you listen to my podcast, episode 114. Do you find you get those terrible headaches at night or after a long day of work at a computer? I used to get this all the time until I started using blue blocks glasses. The one company I trust to make the highest quality and scientifically backed blue light blocking glasses. 
Blue Blocks has a variety of lens options, so you can get a pair that suits to your most pressing needs, such as the Summer Glow lens, which is designed for daytime use, for those who work under intense artificial lighting and suffer from migraines, anxiety, depression, or seasonal affective disorder. Many customers have reported that these glasses have really helped improve their mood. Get 15% off your order today when you use the code Dr. Leaf at checkout. Just go to blueblocks.com and use the code DRLEAF at checkout. The link and details will be in the show notes. I love it. I love that, Neil, because it's just if I look at the results of my clinical trials, our millennials had biological ages that were sometimes 40 years older than what their actual chronological age was and that their brain, because I looked, I, I use neurophysiological techniques, so brain stuff, so brain technology, and uh, we saw like the, the brain waves were like insanely, the, the anxiety levels were just crazy. And then once we taught them mind management, which I did through my app called Switch, I've got this switch called this app called Switch, which we put in the clinical trials. And it's just basically teaching basic mind management skills in a brain science stuff that I've been working on for years. It's a technique I've developed years ago. They once they had the mind management in place, the management of the brain waves changed, the blood work changed, the everything about them changed. And this three S's that you've, I, as you're talking, I'm thinking, wow, this is just fantastic. This is a fantastic technique that is practical and simple to help someone, anyone, not even as you, not, as you say, these three S's are for everyone. It's just a very simple way of getting people to actually self-regulate more about what do they really want out of life instead of just thinking I have to get controlled by the happiness industry or I've got to look like this or, you know, the self-help industry. There's been so much confusion around the motivation self-help happiness industry I think in confusing people understanding those three S's so that's really a great tool on that note what do you think of the happiness industry and you wrote a book on the happiness equations but you approach it very differently yeah I mean the industry is too big if you go on Amazon there's like a hundred thousand books with mm -hmm. the worst happiness in the title if you go on Google and you type in how to be, mm -hmm. the first drop down is happy. Mm -hmm. And then number two is rich and then pretty and then real estate agent. Mm, that's so interesting. If you look at Professor David Meyer's work at the University of Michigan, he has shown that for generations, our measures of abundance have increased, our wealth, our lifespan, our education, but our happiness levels have stayed flat. Mm -hmm. So the way I approach the industry is I think that the underpinning of most of our models on happiness is backwards. Mm. And so – I think that our parents lied to us and they told us that great work lead to big success, lead to being happy. Mm -hmm. Study really hard, get a good, get good grades, and you become a doctor or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think it's the opposite. You have to be happy first in order to do great work and then you have the big success after, both mm -hmm. in terms of mobility, but also, you know, you live longer. Your longevity is up if you're mm -hmm. happy. You know this from the University of Kentucky. So then I think the whole happiness industry is depending on, I don't want to blanket the industry because there's mm -hmm. lots of great players out there, but yeah, I agree. If, if, if anyone says you're on the way to happiness, get do this, like that's not going to make sense. It mm -hmm. doesn't make sense to me. What it is is, no, you have to be happy first and then the great work and the big success follows. How do you be happy first? Well, that's the thing. We actually know. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. not that secret. It's simple studies. Like if you give me 20 minutes of your day every day, I will say, go for a walk in nature or read 20 pages of fiction, or write a gratitude diary about the things you're grateful for, or meditate, or sing in a choir. Like, these are not mm, not, it's not things. Brain, it's not, yeah, it's you not, don't need brain science to actually no. understand that. It's just exactly. logical stuff. Very, very simple stuff. And so when I give my keynote speeches, I'm always talking about how simple these things are. And I say part of the reason we're scared of them is because they're so simple. Oh, I love you know? it. Mm, Part I, of the reason you don't, you don't want to journal every night about the gratitude is because it feels cheesy and it doesn't feel like it would really work, but <laughs> it really does work. Same with fiction. I always say, and I speak mostly to business audiences, so you know this this is like corporate speak. They either don't read enough because no one reads enough because mm -hmm. no one thinks they have time, or they only read nonfiction. That's mm -hmm. the other thing. They only mm -hmm. read nonfiction. By the way, I only write nonfiction, same as you, but it's like, you know, 
fiction is actually what's proven to open up your mirror neurons exactly. and, and make you more compassionate, more empathetic, more, more understanding. It is what's been shown in MRI studies from Emory University to increase all kinds of activity in all kinds of areas of the brain that other forms of art or media simply do not open. Totally correct. You watch Netflix, someone's the director. They come up with the characters, the screenplay, the, the, the script, the, the costumes, the set design, whatever. You, you just passively consume it like a cow eating slop. <laughs> if you eat, read a book, you're the director. You come up with the characters, what they look like, what they sound like, what they're wearing, what the set looks like. What, you're using way more of your brain. There's a old quote from Game of Thrones. It says, a reader lives a thousand lives mm -hmm. before he dies. Mm -hmm. The man who never reads lives only one. Mm -hmm. oh, that's so good. I, I, you, you're speaking my language. It's just, it's it, all the brain research that I've done as well. It's just totally, my, my main thing in therapy, as I said to you, my first prescription on the, on the prescription pad was read, 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 and read a book and close your eyes and read, let the kids listen in a classroom. Get, I would have to teach schools to actually read to their kids. I couldn't believe that I came to this country and there weren't libraries in the schools. You know, there's things so, yeah, you've got things very back to front. So yeah, I agree with you. So just a quick thing on my podcast, like it's called Three Books mm -hmm. because I, because I, I want to read more and I'm looking for the thousand most formative books in the world. So I'm trying to find 333 people and each person asks which three books change your life. And the reason I do that, by the way, Dr. Leaf, is because there's no other way to find them, meaning mm. that I don't trust the piles in the bookstore because I know that they're all paid for. Exactly. You know, So they're all, you know, and I'm part of that game too because I have new books that come out and they get paid for on Me the front too. of the bookstore. Exactly. Right? But I also know that's like, wait, everything at the front of the bookstore is paid to be there, just like every soup at the front of the end cap in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, but the problem is unlike soup, you don't have you have 50 kinds of soup in the aisle, but with books, you have 200 million mm -hmm. and there's a million new books printed in English every year. Mm -hmm. So your chances of finding a good one are bad. And when I interview people and I talk to people about why they don't read, they think, oh, I'm not, they say to me, I'm not a good reader. I don't really like books, you know, and I ask them why, why, why? They, they're kind of too boring. They don't hold my attention. No, that's not your fault. That's the book sucks. Mm, exactly. And you can't find the book that you like because there's a million new ones that come out every year, which means that there's 5,000 new books a day or something like that. It's way too much. So looking into a bookstore or a really Amazon, it's like it's like you're looking into a never-ending sea exactly. of books. That will never, so the reason I'm doing this podcast is because the only way I can figure to figure out what I should actually be reading is to sit down with Judy Bloom and ask her which three books change your life or sit down with Malcolm Gladwell and ask him or David Zanier. That's why I'm doing it. I love and it. Mm -hmm. the pressure it puts on me is that it makes me read those books before. And not to go into another little rant because you got me going now, is no, all rant. these books I, I read are, and you mentioned this yourself and I think you're, we're on the same page, is – the real books, like mm -hmm. actual paper books, mm -hmm. because there's research that shows that if you read on a device mm -hmm. where you can do anything else, you will. Exactly. Well, you speak in my language. You know, I tell you, one of the things in, in my world that I work in is that the world of mental health, they never consider. OK, so this. OK, let me say it this way. Reading a book and building your brain through reading a book is actually one of the most successful and efficient ways of improving your mental health. And that's not spoken about. Everyone just gives you, you know, label, diagnosis, drug. And I mean, I fight against that industry. But reading is just completely overlooked and to build your brain. So as you're reading the story or even reading the fiction and the nonfiction, and I agree with you, it's got to be both. You're doing incredible things in your brain. You're doing incredible things in your body. And you are improving your mental health because it feeds back into your mind. So it's like the number one. If someone has got anxiety and depression, I'll tell them, read. That'll be like the first thing is read, read and build your brain and then the other things. You know, How do you deal with or manage or, or react to the fact that most people don't? <laughs> like like a third of Americans read zero books last year. The average reader reads two to three books yeah. a year. So you are we're speaking the same language, but let's be honest, ninety percent of people or more just simply aren't readers or wouldn't label themselves as people that read norm so then what do you like what's I'm trying to do it with my podcast. Like, what's the pathway to becoming a reader? Does anyone else find bras very uncomfortable? I have always struggled to find one that fits me perfectly, and I hate those annoying tags that scratch my skin. And this is why I am so thankful I found Third Love. Third Love is probably the most comfortable bra I've ever owned and one that fits perfectly. Third Love uses the measurements of millions of women to design bras with all-day comfort and support. 
bras come in over 80 sizes, including half cups, and are made with signature memory foam cups, no slip straps, and smooth, scratch-free band with a table's label, so no annoying itching. Every customer has 60 days to wear it, wash it, and put it to the test. And if you don't love it, return it, and Third Love will wash it and donate it to a woman in need. So far, Third Love has donated over 15 million in bras. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone, so right now they are offering my listeners 15% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash drleaf now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash drleaf for 15% off today. The link and offer details will also be in the show notes. That's such a good question because I dealt with that all the time and I still deal with that. So I always, you know, once people understand what it can do for your mental health and your brain and you start giving people reasons, they're a little bit more open. And then there's things like I used to get my patients that wouldn't read and my adults, all ages, to read things, start with things like asterisks and obliques. I mean, I don't know if you've ever read an asterisk yes. and obliques, but they're absolutely, that's required reading in anyone's life, in my opinion. And as you know, that gets you going because it's, it's it really makes you think and it creates a love because you've got that, you know, you've, it's, it's a step into the reading world. And that's how I would get my patients. And um, and my kids grew up in libraries. You know, take your child to a library. I would be having carry newborn babies into the library and get books. And so my kids grew up around libraries. So they always have books. They never walk around without a book in their bag. You know, so it's a lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And it's you kind of got to teach. I've had to teach people and teach. and But it, mm-hmm. it's, it's a knowledge. It's an education. So you're doing such – that's why I love your podcast because you're doing such a great – service to community just to get their ment- you you helping people with mental health through pushing people to read so that's great i got another one for you mm-hmm. and i wrote an article in 2017 for harvard business review called eight ways to read a lot more books this year mm. and it was a category of all the things i thought could really help people read more and just because i didn't because I, I didn't used to read much myself that's the thing i wasn't always a reader i became one through these things anyway one of the biggest things for me is, is delete the news like literally don't read the news period mm, that'll give you time oh, brilliant yeah, exactly and, and most people subscribe to like newspapers or magazines it's like if you cancel all that and you channel all that reading power and time in the books at the end of the year instead of having a pile of old newspapers you've got a bookshelf of books you've read so you're not out of it because like i don't read the news at all I, I, but i still know about the coronavirus because how can you not there's tvs up in every exactly. library and, and you can listen to a podcast while you're working out and you can catch the day new york daily and you've got it like in five minutes you've got the whole yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah or just look at wikipedia mm-hmm, See, exactly wikipedia is a great objective source of news with no ads so anyway no, that's brilliant. I love it. Okay, so another thing that you bring up that's such an interesting point in the book and one that I completely agree with. In fact, I writ- wrote a whole chapter on multitasking is a myth in a book that one of the books I've written. So, and I, and you also say the same thing. Talk about why multitasking is a myth because we're on the same page with that too. Sure. First of all, multitasking is a word invented mm-hmm. by IBM. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> love the, that. In the mm-hmm. 1960s when they wrote a white paper about how it was the ability of a microprocessor to appear to simultaneously process two tasks at one time by alternating which microprocessor did work. So first of all, you have to have more than one microprocessor and then it appears to look like you're doing two things at once. Thing is, a microprocessor is the human equivalent of a brain and you do not have two brains. Mm-hmm. So this is a word invented by a computer company like 50 years ago. This is not a thing that we can do. If you had two brains, you can multitask, but you can't. So what we're doing today is we are – and people are like, oh, that's not true. I can brush my teeth while changing my socks. It's like, no, you can't. You are taking tiny breaks from brushing your teeth to change your socks. You're taking tiny breaks from changing your socks to brush your teeth. Mm-hmm. So well said. Right. And if you're if you're texting while driving, you're actually not texting while driving and you shouldn't and it's illegal, blah, blah, blah. But you're actually taking a break from driving to text and you're taking a break from texting to drive. Your brain is not doing two things at one time. It's alternating the things it does. You think you're doing two things, but you're just alternating. You're taking gaps. So obviously the recommendation is don't multitask. You mm-hmm. can't. And in my book, you are awesome. I recommend people take an untouchable day. And I do one of these days once a week. I heard you talk about that and I think yeah. it's fantastic. So no, like I did one on Monday this week. It was my best day of this week. On Monday this week, I left my cell phone at home for the day, like no cell phone all day. And I put a piece of tape. It's funny. It's still on my my computer. (laughs) 
not over my camera on my laptop, but I put a piece of tape over the, where, it's, where the internet's connected. So it's, I unconnect it, then I put a piece of tape over it, so I can't see it. Mm. So I can't, I can't. If I and if I put my kerchief up there, it's like there's a piece of tape over it. So I'm like reminded not to go on the internet. And then guess what, Doctor Leaf? I wrote three thousand seven hundred forty-eight words that oh day. Oh my gosh, fantastic! Right, and that's those are three thousand seven hundred forty-eight words. That might be crappy, but they're towards a book that has like a sixty thousand word word count on it. Well, they're working towards something. Exactly. And by the way, just do the math. Like I could technically have 20 days and write a whole book. Like now, is it going to be good that I have to, I haven't edited it yet. But my point is on a normal day, if I was saying I'm going to write today, I'd probably write 500 words. With with a million interruptions and with every interruption exactly. there is, you lose your whole focus and you have to come back again. And Exactly. No, that's, I heard you say that on the Jordan Harbinger show, and I just thought that that is such a good thing because I, I do that. I didn't even call it that day, but I'm going to do your untouchable days. I, I'll text the, my all my team and I'll say, I'm not answering texts for the next five hours or emails. If you send me anything, unless someone's dying, don't contact me. And, you know, it is that's when you really get some decent work done. And sometimes I'll work through the night and sleep later in the morning because then no one mm. can get hold of me. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You are. Yeah, people, you're right. You know, this is interesting. People already do it without realizing they're doing it because they're just mm. cranking on a Saturday afternoon when there's no interruptions naturally. Exactly. But you're actually making uh-huh. it a dedicated choice. You're making it a choice to fit that into your calendar. And I yeah. love that, you know, with the multitasking thing, I'm sure you're familiar with that research where they actually ask people if and who think they can multitask well, you know, they did a whole questionnaire. And the ones that uh, said, oh, I do it so well, at, I'm so good at it. Their IQ, not that IQs, it's just a measurement in a moment of time it's got no indication with potential so I just want to qualify that up front but you could see a distinct drop in the IQ would go down when they were multitasking and go up when they stopped you know so it's just interesting that if, and, and the ones that thought that they were multitasking and were successful at it had the lowest drops in their IQ mm-hmm. so that's the thing with multitasking why it's quite scary because people actually think that they are functioning at a higher level but they're not you know, and, and you actually can't. They're just you just make a. I call it make. You know, you're just making a total mess of the whole thing. And so I love that you that you're addressing that because it's not addressed enough. And people also get all panicky and think, oh well, I'm brushing my teeth and doing my shoes. And you explained that so well. It's little breaks that are happening in between. But you've got mm-hmm. to realize, on a conscious level, we do have little breaks in between. On an unconscious level, it's a whole different story. But on a conscious level. The way you explained it, little breaks in between is very, very good way of explaining it. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love this. Listen, I could have a conversation with you that would, would kind of go on for hours. And so we'll have to have do another podcast sometime. I'd, I'd love to have you back. But I'm respectful of your time. So if you can just – let's just end off by you t- telling people where they can find out more about you, your book, your podcast, and your work. And obviously we'll put that all in our show notes. Sure. My podcast is called Three Books, the number three in the word books, and everything about me, my books, my videos, everything, which is mostly furry, actually, is just www.neil.blog. So just www.neil.blog for everything. Fantastic. And do you have a word of wisdom just to end off the podcast? Do you love it so much you can take the pain and the punishment too? I love that. I love and it. you can hear my kids have just arrived home from school, so this is a perfect, perfect time timing. for me to go perfect, perfect into the point. chaos. <laughs> into the chaos. Enjoy it. Neil, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I hope you found today's podcast interesting and helpful. If you want more tips and help with managing anxiety, depression, and mental health, be sure to visit my website at drleaf.com. And to sign up for my weekly newsletter, where I also include a schedule of my speaking events and so much more. And follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Just look for Dr. Caroline Leaf. Also, I love seeing all your posts on social media about this podcast. I love seeing what resonates with you and what you've learned. So be sure to continue posting and tagging me and letting me know what you think and how these tips worked out for you. And don't forget, leave a review and keep spreading the word about this podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I really hope you learned something new and helpful. Till then, I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf. This podcast represents the opinions of myself 
and my guests. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for educational and informational purposes only. Please consult your healthcare professional for any individual medical questions you may have. While we make every effort to ensure that the information we are sharing is accurate, we welcome any comments, suggestions or corrections of errors.